do that, though, I, I do want to kind of review what we've been talking about, big picture now for Galatians, and that is, is Paul, as he starts this letter, remember he says, grace and peace to you, and we talked about that word grace means charis or gift, right? And what he's really talking about is the gospel. And later he talks about, I'm, I'm concerned or I'm upset that you've so quickly turned away to a different gospel. So, so Paul, there's an urgency in Paul right now that he wants to make sure that I'm going to talk to you about the story. I'm going to talk about living from the story, but I first want to make sure that we're talking about the same story and that we're understanding this. And Kyle, Kyle gave us a pretty simple, you know, way to hang on to this last week, living out of the right story. And it, it's just a, a, a perhaps an expanded, but still, you know, clear, concise picture of the gospel. So what is it? Jesus is born, right? Jesus came here on earth. Jesus died on the cross, but Jesus rose again. And on Easter morning, what do we all say? Jesus is alive. Jesus is risen, right? And we add all that up. You can think of this as a, a simple addition equation. It'd be the summative line right there. What is all that up to? Jesus Christ. That's not his last name, right? That's his title, King. Jesus the King reigns. And if we hold on to that, we recognize, all right, this is a fuller, richer picture of the gospel. But I, I, wanted to, I wanted to go a little bit deeper, maybe try to surround that even bit, a bit more, a little bit more context this week. So related to that gospel story, we, we have kind of what we would think of as a biblical story. How did we get here? Or, or you know, what, are, what is it that, how do we fit into this? Um, and, and most of us grew up with some version of this story. Oh, probably this sounds familiar to some of you, but we know that the Bible covers the story of creation, the fall. Those are right on the first few pages. And then it, it, it enters into a story of redemption and restoration. All right? Now, a lot of times we, we hear kind of a half version of this story, what I'm calling the half story. Um, and so when it comes to the idea of creation, for, for a lot of us, that's just become something to kind of defend and debate, right? And that's, was it a seven days? Was it a literal seven days? Was it, you know, it, it becomes a, a cultural argument, right? Ra ra rather than paying attention to the story or the biblical narrative or really trying to read the text well, it becomes a way to fight with others, if it's mentioned at all. And then our, our, our interpretation of the fall is that, well, we were all born sinners, all right? And, and, and then how do, how do we solve that problem or how do we get out of there? Well, we believe in Jesus. Okay, now once we've, once we've done that, what is, what is our goal in restoration? Well, we, we try to convert others. Um, we separate ourselves maybe from this, this world that's, that's going crazy and going to hell, right? And we just wait for heaven to come or wait to get into heaven might be the popular notion. Now, in that, there's not necessarily things that are wrong. I'm not here to say that that's wrong. But what I want, I want, I want to point out is, is it's, it's something less than complete. And it might be worth saying is, where, where did this story come from? Um, up, up until the 1900s, if you look at church history, there was a much fuller, richer, more robust understanding of the biblical story of this creation, fall, redemption, restoration narrative. And, and what it spoke to is what we just read in Paul, right? It was this holistic, life-encompassing change. Think about the end of what we just read in Galatians. What did the strangers who did not yet know Paul know about him? They knew that at one time he was persecuting the church and those who claimed the gospel, and now he was here to preach it. What did they know? That Paul's entire life, his entire purpose, his entire mission, his entire being had changed, right? Right? And if we look at church history up until around the 1900s, we saw gains in, culture, in cultural influence. And you can think about, you know, churches that were built and um, hospitals and charity organizations and, and, and the way that the church influenced and shaped and, and, in, and um, played its part in, in history, right? Um, around the 1900s, what we might call uh, progressive, um, Western, mostly American and European theologians were kind of beginning to challenge the core of this story, right? Uh, maybe challenging a historical Jesus, 
maybe challenging certain interpretations of the Bible. And so there is a, a movement, a counteractive or counterbalancing movement to say, look, we've really got to stick close to the center of the story, which is we're all sinners, the fall, and we all need Jesus, right? And it was, it was an amen moment. Like, let's not forget the core of the story. And so the focus became this idea of fall and redemption, but we kind of we lopped off the ends of those stories. How did this start? What were we made for? What were we called to do? And, and we focused just on this sinner, right, of, of, hey, I'm a sinner. I need the Lord. I pray the sinner's prayer, and now I got my ticket to heaven. And we, when we reduced the story, we made it something smaller. And in doing so, we see that, that Christianity, right, that idea becomes an option among many options. It becomes, so it becomes one of many alternatives, or in a lot of cases, it became an addition. I'm living my life. I'm doing the things I want to do. Plus, I said a sinner's prayer at camp once, and now I got to take it to heaven in my back pocket, so I'm good. It became a smaller, lesser version of the gospel. And in that time, we've seen uh, actually the church lose cultural influence. Interestingly enough, the story got smaller and the impact got story, smaller. So now I, I want to set side by side this, this half story next to a fuller story. Again, same categories, creation, fall, redemption, restoration. But, but rather than just fall into kind of that debate of, you know, the seven days and creation and stuff, let, let's get to the heart of that story, which is that we were made in God's image, that we are his representatives here on earth. God made all things. He looked at me, and said, it's good. Then he made man and woman. And he said, it's very good. And he said, be fruitful and multiply. Give us that commission, that mandate to go and do good things with the stuff he had made. You see how that's critical to the story if we leave that part out? Not, not only were we born a sinner, which keeps it small and personal, and then once I accept that, I can enter into this little sin management cycle, right, where I wake up every day and I pray really hard not to mess up, Lord. But we understand that the story is much larger that sin actually entered into the world at the fall. And so it's not just a personal, private little issue that I've got to fight and wrestle with, and it is. But it, it's, it's a world problem. It's a systematic problem. And so when we read the newspaper, when we go to our school board meetings, when we enter into brokenness, we're not shocked or surprised. We go, this is what sin does in the world. This is what a, a, a deceiver and a deception and a lie does in the world. And, and, and in understanding that, we recognize that it's, it's not just something that we're wrestling with ourselves. But we're, we're wrestling, as Paul said, against darknesses, against the powers and the principalities. It's a much more cosmic fight that we've been called to. Redemption, yes, we believe in Jesus, right? If you believe in Jesus, if you confess him in the tongue, you will be saved. I'm not denying that in any way, but it's, it's even larger than that. Right? It is we find our life in Jesus. Uh, to, to, to live is gain, to die is Christ, right? We, we understand that we now live in and through the power of Christ and, and the gift of the Spirit that he gave through us. So it's more than just, I've adopted the right set of ideas. I got the right thinking. I know Jesus is my Savior. Now I can go on with my regular life. But as we see in Paul, our life changes radically, and maybe not all at once, but over time, day by day, year by year, God is sanctifying us and changing us into something much more like himself, much more who we were created to be. We call that sanctification. And again, this idea of restoration doesn't get reduced to, well, I got my ticket to heaven, so I'm going to try to pass out some more to a few other people as fast as I can. And then I'm just going to, you know, not get messed up in the world because it's, it's all messed up. And then I'm just going to wait to be sucked up to heaven someday. That'll be good. No, we go back to that, again, that cultural mandate that's all along, that we've been called to partner with God to renew all things, to renew all things. So look, let's, let's now do this. You see the half story and the full story side by side. Now we're going to lay that full story beside the full gospel where I was a moment ago, right? And where Kyle talked about this. 
Jesus is born. Jesus comes, as he called himself, right, as a, as a son of man, as, as fully human and yet fully divine. And we go back to the full story, and we go, we are made in God's image. And what do we see there? That divine human partnership. What God has always intended to do. That he's God, he's the creator, there's no confusion there. We are the created thing. And yet we are to reflect his image into creation. Jesus dies. That's, that's baffling, right? That's not what any of the disciples expected. They thought they were going to conquer and kick out Rome and take back Jerusalem. But we know, understand why Jesus did that. And it's not just to help us manage our little sins. It's because sin entered the world. And in going to the cross, Christ defeated sin. Sin is defeated. Then we get to this is that Jesus is alive. And that that is more than just a mental idea, something to understand and get a hold of in your brain. It's it's to recognize that we have a life in Jesus through the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. And finally, if, if Jesus Christ reigns, if Jesus is king, we look out and we understand that we have been called to partner with him as we were called to partner with him from the very beginning to help renew all things. And we're not just crouching and hiding and waiting and fearful, but we're living the life that Jesus called us to. And that is the abundant life. Why have I come so that you may have life and have it in abundance? This is the fuller, richer, just more exciting story, isn't it? Right? And that was a lot. Um, if you want to know more about this, I read a great little book this week. It's very thin. I really did read it in a week. It's called The Creative Minority by John Tyson. So for you readers out there, I see two people taking down their notes, putting it in their Amazon cart.